Well, thank you everyone for your attention. I know it's been a really long day, so this is going to be the last panel of the day. Um, so I, I wanted to take a moment to um, introduce everyone, and I'm going to have them um, explain a little bit about why they're on the panel and what they're up to. Um, so the first person, again, I'm not going to do this in order, I'm going to do it on the order I have here on my list, is uh, introduce uh, Robert Grant from Crown Sterling. Robert. Uh, Matt Longren from uh, Ooh La La. Eddie Lee from Pledge Camp. Frank from uh, Burst IQ. Mary Rosario from uh, the Digital Ethics Lab at Oxford University. Nicholas Hahn. Ah, there he is. Nicholas Hahn from Singularity University. And Professor, Professor Ali Hassami, who's from the IEEE. Okay, so let's just do this. Um, everyone, I'd like to, everyone to kind of understand what you guys are actually up to uh, before we start this larger conversation about emerging technologies. So Frank, why don't you take it away because you're at the end there. I have to make sure this on. So it's good I can only go by my first name. So everybody knows me now. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, I'm Frank Ricotta. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Burst IQ. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really honored and humbled to be here. Uh, it's been really an amazing day with a lot of uh, amazing panelists and, and just everybody that's out here that I met has been truly impressive. Um, so thank, thanks, Matthew, for, ha for having us. Um, what, you know, what we're all about at Burst IQ is really focused on health e equity and access. You know, we use blockchain to help facilitate that from a tech perspective. And yeah, I'm a technology geek. So I have a little bent, bent to that, but you know, foundational and why we were so excited to, to work, uh, participate with Humanity 2.0 is goes down to just basic, basic core values. And that at its very core was just the respect of each and every person's human dignity. And uh, thank you, thank you again for the initiative. The other thing um, I'd like to just, just make everybody aware of, I'm very happy to talk uh, on behalf of the U.S. Department of Commerce and International Trade Administration that we're, we are collectively launching an economic development activity focused on facilitating uh, the use of blockchain in initiatives such as Humanity 2.0 and others um, and, and really hope to, to drive a broader, uh, a broader eco um, international economic commerce and and partnerships um, for both U.S.-based companies and outside of the U.S. All right. Hello. It's a delight to be here. Thank you. Uh, I come from Singularity University at, at the NASA Ames Research Center in California. And we do programs for large corporations, for entrepreneurs, for governments, for investors on how to leverage advanced technologies like AI, robotics, digital biology to solve the world's biggest challenges. And our perspective on that is, number one, the world's biggest challenges are solvable. Number two, there's a couple mindsets that are very useful in doing so. One of them is what we call an exponential mindset, recognizing that these technologies are growing at exponential rates, doubling year in, year out in their price performance. And the other one is an abundance mindset. We all have grown up in an economy and societies that are based on scarcity. When actually, if you extend out the power of technology and the power of human creativity and innovation, we can create a world of abundance. And that's really the challenge, I think, for all of us today. My name is Eddie. I'm the co-founder and president of Pledge Camp. What we're building is a crowdfunding platform uh, using blockchain technology. Uh, if you're familiar with Kickstarter and Indiegogo, these platforms have given entrepreneurs around the world incredible opportunity to raise funds directly from a network of individuals, from often their target markets, and not based on whether they know a VC or are keyed into these pretty exclusive communities. Um, the reason we got into this, because myself and my co-founders, six years ago, we started our company doing consumer electronics. We funded our company through Kickstarter. Uh, multiple times, we've become among the top 1% most funded uh, on the platform. But over the years, we've also seen how Bad, it's gotten in a sense that there's no accountability issue, uh, mechanisms. There's issues of trust that are causing consumers to doubt crowdfunding. It's been r much harder for people to raise funds. Um, and it's a, it's a lost opportunity because this is really a, a way to democratize opportunity for a lot of these entrepreneurs who don't have any other options. And what we're trying to do is really create a more sustainable model and redesign it from the ground up and hopefully help crowdfunding really fulfill its potential. 
Um, I'm Matt Lochran, uh, co-founder and CMO of Ula La. We're a blockchain-based fintech company. A lot of blockchain up here. Um, we're really focusing in on banking the under and unbanked. So really work with the most vulnerable uh, demographics. And there's a lot of talk today about faith-based NGOs, corporations, how do you work together? We're doing that. All right? So we have partners in this room from corporate and private to the ICMC sitting right there with uh, Secretary General and Senior Vitello uh, to actually actualize this type of technology for inclusion in different jurisdictions around the world. So there's people here that are policymakers that we work with to governments. I mean, it's, it's very doable. You just need to act, which I think is a big thing coming out of this forum. Who can you partner with? Who can you make actions? So our whole goal is to provide people with financial choices that they don't have. It's very expensive to be poor. Let me say that again, it's expensive to be poor. You get the highest fee structures, okay, you get predatory on consistently, so we're here to at least stop it and dampen that, but we can only do that with partners that are here. Hi, my name is Robert Grant. I'm the founder and CEO of Crown Sterling. We are not a blockchain company. <laughs> we are an encryption company. Uh, I make the distinction because most people actually believe, you ask most consumers, they think blockchain is encryption. Um, most of the world is protected by the same types of encryption, that's RSA, uh, as well as elliptic curve or SHA-3. Uh, that's what is used on Bitcoin's platform. And um, I'm a mathematician. Uh, I am also a serial entrepreneur. And as part of my mathematical work, I discovered the first prime number uh, infinite pattern uh, and published it last month with Cornell University. And um, that allows us to infinitely predict prime numbers uh, it also allows for new methodologies in the way we approach encryption, uh, which we're not using prime numbers at all. But as part of that discovery, there was also some fundamental discoveries that happened around mathematical constants and their relationships with each other. That's very exciting for us because we think that this is something that could be used around the world to potentially increase data sovereignty for consumers, not just large organizations or you know, sovereign nations, but actually for people like you and me. And I think a lot of the discussion today has been about ethics and what's right. And as there's a quid pro quo of data, when I go on Facebook, do I know that I'm making this contract of adhesion? And probably most people do not. And so what we'd like them to be able to have is a choice to not have Facebook be in a position to have to self-police itself, put itself in a dichotomous relationship with, between its shareholders and the greater good, as it was referred to earlier today, but rather actually have a system where consumers can be empowered to protect themselves. And uh, this is something we're very excited about and we think has very broad reaching application and we're very grateful to be here today. Okay, I'll say my name again. Uh, it's Maria Rosaria Tadeo. Uh, sorry, just because I know it's very hard for whoever is not born, was not born Thank in you. to say that. Most kind. Um, so I'm the deputy director of the Digital Ethics Lab, which is a research group at the University of Oxford. Uh, I'll be humble and say that we are one of the leading research group in the world on digital ethics. Uh, what we do is um, address ethical issues which have to do with whatever digital technologies you can think of. At the moment we're running projects which run from uh, privacy, transparency, uh, impact of digital technologies on human well-being, cyber conflicts, uh, and how to develop AI for social good, um, specifically SDGs. Our mission is this one. We understood uh, many, many years ago, about 20 years ago, that digital technologies are reshaping uh, our societies, the environment in which we live, the way we interact with each other, the way we understand ourselves as human beings. These are profound changes which have huge, serious ethical impact. So we do a lot of theoretical research uh, on these ethical uh, aspects, and we write all those nice ethical papers which nobody reads. Uh, on top of that, we build what we uh, define translational ethics. You might have heard about translational medicine, translating uh, biological research into clinical findings. So bring stuff that is developed uh, in a lab onto the bedside and cure people. We try to do the same things. We translate all those nice, boring papers into stuff that companies like Google, Facebook, um, can use to do a job uh, which might be more ethically um, shaped. Uh, uh, and so we run projects which are funded by UK research councils, European Union, as well as uh, major digital companies. Um, I mentioned Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, and many, many others. Good afternoon.
afternoon. Um, I'm Ali Hissami. I'm presenting IEEE and the projects that I'm responsible for. I'm honored and grateful to be here to share the information. Um, IEEE is the world's largest technical professional organization which edging towards half a million members globally. So after United Nations, probably that's the most representative professional technical organization. Similar to our hosts who have been gracious enough to take responsibility on behalf of the humanity and drive humanity too, IEEE also took it upon itself to drive a program called Ethically Aligned Design. Uh, my colleague, uh, John Havens, who was here this morning, actually manages that program and under the Ethical Aligned Design, which is now published as a public document on, only a month or so ago. So I would encourage you to refer to that. If not, please ask us here from IEEE. We'll gladly share it. We have started a number of fairly, if you like, beneficent and daring programs. One of them is developing a suite of standards on how to design emerging technologies, ethics embedded in it. Now, you would argue, uh, why, why should a technical professional organization develop a suite of ethical standards? Frankly, why not? Why, why exactly the same as our honorable uh, hosts here? Somebody needs to take leadership, somebody needs to d fulfill their moral duties in this context, and I'm really pleased that IEEE has done that, and I'm also honored to be assisting with that program. So under ethically aligned design, we've got currently 14 standards on the go, addressing various aspects of ethical behavior of products and services from emerging technologies. And the, if, if I dare say, the second program, which is of significance and relevance here, is how to certify for these ethical properties. Again, that's a, a vacuum in the existing mark, global marketplace, and because IEEE is a not-for-profit organization, is accepted the responsibility to develop a series of certification programs currently focused on transparency that we heard a lot in the previous panel. We all need transparency by institutions, by products, by decision makers. The second bit for certification is accountability and responsibility. And final bit is about algorithmic bias. Great. Well, I want to open it up now just for, for general conversation. So when you say emerging technology, I think people have one of two reactions, right? They either get really excited or they're terrified uh, of, of the, you know, what, they're, what the kids are going to grow up uh, like. So I want to ask each one of you. Now, obviously, for the companies that are in emerging tech, you guys obviously have a you know, positive perspective on it, which is why you started your companies. But I'd like you to, to talk about why, what, what drove you into the emerging tech field and, and how, do you ex how do you expect or hope it will actually add value to the, to the human family. And second, I, I would like you to, to speak to someone who actually is afraid of marine technologies and, and say, how do you actually work through those, those fears yourselves? Frank, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, well, you know, tech, technology is really just an enabler. So when you look at it, when you look at it for technology's sake, just for technology's sake, it, it sometimes become, can become a, a useless pursuit. One of the things that attracted us to uh, blockchain is not the technology itself, but really more uh, the philosophy behind it, which is the empowerment uh, of a person and really extending the liberty of a person and giving them access, um, more universal access and just, you know, kind of more social, social justice type access to goods and services um, such as uh, uh, payment systems, financial inclusion, health access. Um, and the best technologies are those technologies you don't know are there. And we have a lot, we have a lot of talk around AI, uh, but how many of us use, um, use a map app or use something like Siri or Hey Google to, to get a response through a voice response? You're starting to interact with some level of intelligence in the back end. So, you know, my, my thing is that from a technologist perspective, we have to look at really enabling capabilities that allow us to address some of these problems in ways we couldn't, um, but have to make it so transparent that most people just don't even know it's there and it just becomes part of their lives. Anyone else? So I'm drawn to technology in terms of its potential for us to completely redesign humanity and our relationship with each other and the planet for a more sustainable world. The recent IPCC report, if you caught a quote there, was incredibly powerful. These are the world's leading scientists who declared 
to be able to get on track by the year 2030, that's only 10, 12 years from now, it will require unprecedented transformation in all aspects of society. Raise your hand if you think we're actually going to be able to achieve that with our current trajectory. We won't. We need radically different new solutions and technology applying this power of this exponentially growing technology and re and challenging our value systems and our received wisdom in terms of the way that we have been applying technology and relating to ourselves, challenging that to redesign a future where we can live in harmony with each other and with nature. Because I would agree that climate change is one of our greatest challenges, but it's also our greatest opportunity to reshape humanity 2.0 so that we thrive amongst each other's and in our planet. Let me ask a more provocative question here. With emergent technologies, right, how do we know what the right emergent technologies are? How do we go about making judgments between emergent technologies that may actually harm humanity and the ones that may accelerate human progress? Like this is something, maybe this is for the, the one academic on, on the panel, but I think it's something that a lot of people are concerned about, that technology companies are running away and, and they're moving forward and they're spitting out new products because they have, they have a market, right? And they're driving sales. But is anyone thinking about how these technologies may actually affect civilization down the road? So how do people that are in the industry and then people who are, of course, studying the industry's effects, how do you guys work through this and reconcile these things? I think, spe spe sorry, specifically talking about blockchain, and I, I know Matthew feels this too, is when we sometimes say that we're doing this company on blockchain, we get like rolled eyes or people who are very skeptical because in the industry there's been a lot of there's been hype, and there's been scandals and, and lack of regulation and, and ethical behavior, quite frankly. But I think it's important that even uh, for being in Silicon Valley and you get those similar reactions to blockchain, either enthusiasm or fear or just a really polite apathy, it's important for the people to in blockchain too to understand that there's hard limitations of blockchain. The blockchain doesn't know what's happening in the real world, how people are interacting. And there are limits, but what it's really done without getting into like the specifics of how it works, it's created a really new uh, computing platform that no one in, in human history has had anything like this before. And what it allows us to do um, is really fine tune and tweak some levers and create an incentive structure that hopefully lets your efforts scale in a decentralized way. So instead of Again, like asking people to abide by rules. Uh, if you're a centralized platform and have a terms of service or something like that, you can create a incentive here with a token or, or this kind of contractual agreement that exists in software that really, again, is, is programmed by the humans. But if you know the limitations, and you know that you can create a right incentive structure. That's really what we're trying to do, um, rather than just impose rules. And we, for example, when we talk about emerging technology. We went emerging technology married with emerging markets. Right, so there, there's a lot of room there for us to be very ethical in how we set up our organization as well. So our primary market right now is Mexico. Right? About 70% of the country is unbanked. Massive number. Right? There's a lot of ways for us to build trust and transparency, which I heard a lot about today. But we do that with our blockchain as well. We're building people a financial identity that they can take with them around the globe. We're building them a new credit portfolio, if you will, where they can qualify for microfinancing based on if they're even just sending their mother money, right? We're using small steps and increments to actually incentivize the right behavior. But how do you convince them that? How does the, how does the user, say in an emerging market, who I, I barely understand blockchain, and I've been listening to people talk about it for, anyways. It's simple. You don't tell them there's blockchain, all right? If I told okay, you, that's, that makes sense. Sense. it's really that simple. Um, it just confuses them, or anybody. If I told half this room about blockchain, you start rolling your eyes, like Eddie just said. This is like how the internet, right? You just turn on your phone and it works. You just care that it works. You don't care what's behind it and actually doing what he probably does from encryption. But um, <laughs> it's very, but that's really the mentality. You have to make it simple for adoption by the end user. We're very much a, a base of the pyramid, bottom up company to actually grab adoption. And I mean, one of the reasons that we're, we do that is partners, right? Network effects, how do we get very fast adoption so everybody can share in that as well. Mary Rosario, represent for academic community there. Okay, uh, no pressure. Uh, no. So adoption by opacity makes me jump on the chair because we didn't real, we weren't told how the internet, or we didn't tell people how the internet worked for the first 10, 15 years. Then everyone went ballistic when they realized, well, you're giving your data for free service and that's going to shape the way your credit core is defined and so on and so forth. So let's be careful on how we want to have trust and support adoption. On a more general sense, how do you know that an emerging technology is going to be good or bad? 
why you don't. Because technology, and especially digital technology, is dual use. Everything, any object, object can be used for one purpose or the other. Digital is increasingly more so. Now, this is an important aspect because we have to understand that to make sure that we design something which is going to be used more often for a good purpose than a bad purpose, you need an ethical thinking. Now, the previous panel was really encouraging from one side, but from the other made me also think, ethics is not just about do the right thing, be a good person. It's not about what you told when you were a child. Ethics is about funding trades off, deciding when you're going to have a little bit less privacy so that you can have a bit more research in bioethical um, area, when you're going to have a bit more security and so less privacy again, or more transparency and then less easiness of adoption. It's a bunch of trades off that require careful considerations because those trades off shape society, shape the environment in which we are. How you do that? Uh, there, there are methodologies. Um, we call it uh, ethical foresight, understanding when you're going to design a specific artifact and you deploy it in a specific context, what are the risks and what are the opportunities. And the last thing I want to say is that ethics is not there to tell us what we should not be doing. It's not the man who slaps on your wrist when you steal the candies from the jar. Ethics is also there to tell us what we absolutely should be doing, especially with these technologies. It's about what opportunities we should not be missing, because otherwise our children in 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to tell us, you knew how to cure cancer and you didn't? Why? Uh, you knew how to stop climate change and you didn't? Why? So many, many times, uh, many companies to, to whom I talk, to which I talk, they tell me, well, actually, I'm not sure I'm going to do that thing, because I'm not sure how it's going to pay back. And if it's problematic, then I'm investing money and risking reputation for something which is not bringing profit. So you, we need to understand what are the opportunities in which we want to invest, and that's why ethics is important. To round up, the fear that something might not be good should not stop emerging technology. It's the need to control how the emerging technologies actually behave in the real world, which will enable us to achieve the best of the technology and minimize the risks. On the question of knowing whether or not a technology will be good ultimately or bad. Um, I'm reminded of the sort of story of when the atom was first split. And out of splitting the atom came as a result the potential for building a nuclear bomb. Now when I discovered the prime number pattern, I was immediately approached by people that said, wow, now you can crack encryptions. And I, that was not what I was thinking, I thought, well, I was looking for the connection between gravity and electromagnetism, and that's how I discovered the prime number pattern. And I found the constants and the language that connects the constants, like verbs in this language of mathematics, this universal language of mathematics. I never thought that this could cause potentially havoc in financial economies. But what we all have to realize is that in physics, uh, Albert Einstein was very much of the belief, like many, many physicists are, that every action must have an equal opposite reaction. We cannot break such an equation. So that means any new technology that comes out must have, by definition, both good and bad consequence associated with it. We could talk about polio vaccinations. The greater good is that we get polio vaccinations, but we know that some people die every year because of polio vaccinations. Right now in Europe, we have a problem. Why? People don't want to get the measles vaccination. We have this problem also extending to the United States. The reason they don't want the vaccination is because they don't believe the pharmaceutical companies or the health authorities have done the appropriate work to look at the cumulative effects of aluminum, which is used as a preservative. So now we have a measles outbreak in Europe and the United States. But is it better for the greater good or is it better for your family? And in the questions of ethics, I see this all the time, whether it's related to politics or new technologies, it doesn't really matter. What people will justify is what they believe will benefit them. It took me a long time to realize that fact. It doesn't matter to me. You could have a great corporation like Google. You could have a great corporation like Apple. Google went as far as making it part of its credo to say, don't be evil. But just as Shakespeare says, and I believe it's Taming the Shrew, methinketh the woman doth protesteth too much. Whenever someone is saying they don't want to be something, you also have to start looking to see what's on the other side of that coin, because all things have equal opposite reactions. Professor Ali. Um, 
driven by the ethically aligned design that I referred to, Professor Spiegelman, who's uh, my honored friend here, actually drafted a standard which codifies 2,000 years of human ethics that uh, Father Philip referred to earlier on. These three fundamental tenets of uh, philosophy and ethics relate to virtue ethics that I've learned all from Sarah, relate to um, <clears throat> basically fundamental human values, virtue ethics from Aristotle, um, then we have duty ethics or the ontological version from John, uh, sorry, from Emmanuel Kant, and then we've got the <clears throat> Um, consequentialism that uh, comes from John Stuart Mill. Now, these three fundamental tenets help us to actually evaluate the impact of a technology based on, effectively, philosophical ethics. And on top of that, in the standard that we are developing, we are adding a fourth leg, and that is ethnic ethics, whether people have their own local values, do not fit this 2,000-year history of ethical development and philosophical development. So we, have, we are in the final stages of codifying, establishing social impact effectively, and encouraging businesses to go from shareholder value to social value. Right. Well, I, 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 like, the, I like the aspect of, of both, sides of the, both sides of the coin, because I think that's important. You know, throughout innovations throughout, throughout history, all the positive goods that's happened uh, or that's been a result of that in society, even through the Industrial Revolution, had a corresponding bad, which in some aspects was worker exploitation. It's the same in the digital space. There's a whole, there's a whole dimension of digital exploitation. You know, we went through all these evolutions of the internet where it was fundamentally been a winner take most. And we've seen some of the back end of that now where where our data in many ways have been exploited for other benefit and even negative benefit for ourselves. Now we deal, we deal with dealing with health data. I mean, everybody says, oh, it'd be wonderful to have all our health profiles online and we have better quality interaction with our care providers. And I actually think a more personal interaction about who we are because my, my personal belief that data is really the currency that changes the whole health, health economy. You know, everybody, everybody wants it because they know it's valuable. Companies are created every day to generate more of it. Um, researchers uh, definitely can leverage it. I think a lot of breakthroughs will be second, second and bench level data research. But bad people know it's valuable too and they try, try to exploit it. Uh, and especially if you get uh, an unethical employer. So I'm not going to hire you because you may have a certain medical condition. That's not a good thing. <clears throat> so we, have to, we definitely have to balance the good and bad and, and know the positive consequences and the unintended consequences. And again, it's all about are we enabling the liberty of, a, of an individuals and individuals? Are we enabling the suppression of individuals uh, and societies? Uh, I think both are possible through, through the evolution of what we're seeing uh, on the precipice of this next technology wave. And it's up to organizations like this to really make sure it goes down the right path. Thanks, Frank. I'm gonna end with one more question for all of you. I want you all to answer. What is the uh, emerging technology field that you f are most hopeful about, you think would have the greatest positive impact on humanity, and what's the one that you're concerned about the most? Frank, why don't you start us off and we'll go around. Well, okay, since uh, blockchain dominates the panel, uh, I, like, I like blockchain, not from a technology, but more uh, from the philosophy and way of doing things, because you know, the underlying culture in the community is really the empowerment of a person and a person's liberty. So I really like that. Um, it has some downsides, obviously, and I think What's on the fence is this whole, this whole aspect of machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think it can go either way. Um, probably most concerned about it going, going the wrong way if it gets out of control without the right ethical boundaries. I would, uh, in the field of energy, I think solar energy in, in the renewable energy sphere is uh, extremely promising, but I'm gonna pick the one I'm gonna pick is one that demonstrates that uh, money can be made by radically changing our systems, and that is meat. Uh, last week, a company called Beyond, uh, Beyond Meat IPO'd. And if we had had a conversation only five years ago, and I said that throughout every Burger King in the United States, there's going to be a plant-based protein hamburger alternative, you would have thought I was crazy. But not the folks at Beyond Meat. 
They've been investing in this over the last five, six years. They IPO'd last week, and it was the most successful IPO since the year 2000. Because people are realizing our food system is going to radically change. Now, what happens when we go to plant-based meat substitutes? Suddenly, we reduce almost 25% of our greenhouse gases. We stop killing sentient beings. We use less land, less water, less energy, et cetera, et cetera. So it's an example of a breakthrough technology which can have huge reverberations throughout our society. In terms of a technology which hasn't been mentioned, which I do, I think has great uh, good, but also great concern, especially in the realm of ethics, is CRISPR the ability to genetically engineer ourselves and all living things um, has profound implications for good and profound implications for the bifurcation of society, potentially. I'm also really high on Beyond Meat. Very excited about that. Uh, but I guess I'll speak to my experience and say blockchain, again, for both uh, what I'm excited about and what I'd probably be fearful about. I'm excited, like I mentioned, to see, and like Frank mentioned, the culture of people tinkering with what can this new technology do for people and for society? How can we, like I said, adjust incentives in a way that we never could before um, and really try to take all of these existing problems and apply new technology to it? That's always a, an opportunity and it's always an exciting time. Uh, but the downside is, of course, the, and the flip side to the coin is that um, it's a little bit of a technology in search of a problem. Uh, a solution in search of a problem sometimes, and a lot of people are jumping on the hype train or straight up using it, um, the aspects of uh, you know anonymity or permanence in negative ways. Um, so it remains to be seen how much time it'll take for us to kind of work out the kinks and get to a place where people figure out what to do with it, but uh, like any you know paradigm shift in a, in a computing platform, I'm confident that we'll get there. So I think enough has been talked about blockchain, so I'll go a little bit differently. Um, so what I'm looking forward to, I think you know, technology has the most potential is something around biometrics as well. Um, we talk about blockchain and stuff for payment systems, but eventually that might be biometric. Now, on what I'm most concerned about, I don't think it's been released yet. Like if you look at Gen Z coming up, who's been literally born digital, who knows what's gonna come out of this specific generation, maybe it could be from an ethical standpoint, or if they, you know, whatever it might be, They've, they've been you know, in cyberbullying now forever as well. So it's been really interesting um, or scary as well coming out of that generation, what types of technologies might be released here in the next 10 years. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the notion of expanding what it means to be a human being. And the reason I say that is because even 30, 40, 50 years ago, we never thought of our digital life as being part of who we are. And this is raising lots of new ethical questions right now because what we've done is we've expanded and created another dimension of individuality. And that higher dimension of individuality also can bring along with it new ways of looking at monetization. I remember when I was in college, my buddies would say, hey, you wanna go down to the blood bank and earn some money? It may be in the future that your thoughtful decision to sell your, some of your data in a format that you're accepting of, in a way that you like, and knowing that you actually are making such a transaction, not one that's a contract of adhesion, not one that is basically foisted upon you because you didn't want to raise 78 pages and just click agree. I think that that could bring dramatic change to the planet. I think it could actually lead to a notion that we become true human beings rather than human doings. And I think we've spent the last century being human doings rather than human beings. So we've lost the arts, we've lost music, we've lost so many elements of society and education that have fallen by the wayside in exchange for hyper-specialization, which has led us down paths of reductionism. And I personally believe that if we could tackle being human, we could actually be human beings to the rest of humanity. And I think that's what Humanity 2.0 is about. And then secondly, I believe that we could actually have the time to tackle the big issues like genetic or gene editing, which in some circles is, is a hiss and a byword. Not supposed to be said, I have several patents on gene editing, on using sound and light electromagnetism to be able to change outcomes of phenotypic expression. 
And I think that's a, a fantastic future. I think free energy, I saw technology yesterday that was literally a piece of tin foil, 10 microns thick, that can supply, if built into a five pound cube, 3.6 kilowatts with no light, not connected to any plug-in in the wall, and simply harnessing what we call neutrino or vacuum fluctuations. To me, those are very exciting things. And what we want to be able to do to help enable that is to create an encryption platform that each and every one of us can use. It's called Time AI, that each and every one of us can use to be able to safeguard this expanded dimension of who you are, which is what your digital life is. And I personally believe that digital rights should be looked upon as if they are human rights. Difficult to top that up. Um, so the answer is going to be AI, uh, artificial intelligence, um, both for the great opportunities and the great risks. Uh, the great opportunities is building on what you just said, because AI has this great potential of free us, free our time from tedious tasks, stuff we do not want to do, things which are dangerous, and that time can be dedicated to human flourishing. Uh, if this is the case, then we have to make sure that in a society where there are going to be more AI. And this is the trajectory where we are on. We need to make sure that that means more humanness in any possible sense. The risks that I see there are not uh, any of those sci-fi singularity related risks. If you read about that, just go, go do something else. It's no scientifically substantiated, but it's much more concrete one. AI can enable human wrongdoing. It can enable us, our biases, our prejudice, our superficialities, it makes it much easier to be a wrong or an evil person. Uh, and this is the risk that I see there. Without the right guardrails, AI can facilitate us going on to the wrong path rather than, rather than on the right path. So as ever is a tool, uh, and we have to make sure that we harness its value in the best possible ways. Um, we have come 2,000 years of civilization, and if you look at the fabric of the legal protection that we've got in much of the world, is about preventing harm to people, physical harm. So long as we don't physically harm, but we can steal their data, we can profile them, we can commoditize them, we can sell them. So we need to make the transition to the next stage of humanity's enlightenment. And that is take social responsibility, respect each other's differences, and respect human values. In, in reality, I really don't have a favorite or fear about technology. I prefer to be upbeat about the value and virtues of human thinking and ingenuity, so long as value in terms of moral values are built in every consideration that we come to, whether it's nuclear power or future free energy comes out of neutrinos or blockchain. I don't have a favorite, and I don't think humanity has a favorite but it needs to factor in the element of tolerance and social value and human value. And just to finish, frankly, one thing I haven't heard today, that's uh, the word love, and not, that's not love in the poetic sense. This is the divine love. Ultimately, the founder of this institution here preached that love is what binds us together, what brings us humanity, not exploiting each other, not benefiting from each other's labor, from each other's data, from each other's profile, and selling it behind each other's back. So I hope that would dominate our future. I really want to give uh, Professor Ali the last word there because I think that's a really beautiful way to end. Um, but let me just uh, start by saying, uh, someone asked me, what is humanity 2.0? What was 1.0? And let me just let me quickly define that from our perspective. Humanity 1.0 was when we all looked at each other as individual tribes, all competing for scarce resources. It was inherently an adversarial dynamic. Humanity 2.0 is when we recognize we're on one planet, we're one tribe, and if we're going to survive, we're going to have to do it together. So one of the reasons why I want to talk about this is because this is emerging technologies in many ways is going to affect our future. And, and whether they become, technology becomes a good thing, 
which, which saves humanity, at least in some respects, or it kills us off, is I think dependent upon us. And that's why Project Vision, what Father Ezra talked about, about defining what human flourishing is, and then determining what the impediments are, is so important. Because if we don't have a roadmap or a sense of, of what we're trying to build together, then I don't think we're going to be able to achieve it. What you're seeing here is a foreshadowing of, of next year's panel, uh, which is uh, May 8, 2020. And uh, we hope you'll be able to, to come. And it's, it's really uh, looking at how can we apply emerging technologies to actually um, tackle or address very concrete problems. So trying to get very practical. Um, the, the last thing I, I, I want to say, and it's more of an announcement, I'm really excited to announce. Uh, Tomas, you're in the room? OK. Well, he, OK. Uta, you can stand up then. So uh, one of the things that we, we're, uh, we're honored to be working on is, uh, is looking at a way to um, leverage uh, the Catholic Church's building platform. And I, th I think you, you all heard me mention it's pretty substantial. It's the largest building platform in the world. How can we uh, leverage that building platform to, I'm going to use the example of LEED certification, but green certify the entire platform. And then how can we as well well certify it? So certifying to make sure that the environmental outputs are as low as possible, but also optimizing the buildings for human health and wellness. We want to do this to the entire Catholic Church's building platform, and we want to do it by 2030. You can imagine the impact that would have globally. This is not just about making a statement. This is also about uh, providing models that other networks can follow. If we can get the Catholic health, health uh, system globally to go green and go well, that provides them a competitive advantage, and we're hoping that will incentivize other health networks to follow suit. And we're looking to do this uh, with parishes and with schools as well. So anyways, anyone who's interested in, in, in those particular um, uh, you know, uh, area, area, areas of, of, of greening the world and, uh, and, and welling, uh, we'd like to work with us on that. It's an open invitation. So uh, in the coming months, we'll be working to build that out. And we're honored to be working with the, the Global Catholic Climate Movement and other partners uh, to architect that, um, that strategy, which we'll then present formally. And then uh, we're going to be uh, basically presenting next year in 2020 how we're planning on executing it. And it's a fairly... Uh, fairly uh, obvious uh, by, by developing showcases, developing the partnerships necessary to affect the actual standards in the buildings themselves, and then to demonstrate the financing models that are necessary in order to fund them and then pay them back. So anyways, I, I hope you'll join us next year, uh, May 2020. Um, we have our dinner at the St. Regis at 7. And uh, for those of you who want, want to join the, the Basilica Tour, uh, we'll be heading there now. Thanks very much. The 2019 Humanity 2.0 Forum is brought to you by Cisco Systems, CSR solutions that are accelerating global problem solving in ways that have never been attempted before. To Ulala, providing mobile blockchain solutions for the unbanked. And to Pledge Camp.